Good afternoon, everyone. We're now going to hear <coughs> an opening statement from Miss Anne Studd, Queen's Council, on behalf of the Mayor of London. And I can see Miss Studd on my screen, so I hope you can see us, Miss Studd, and hear me. Is that the case? I can see you and hear you. Good. Thank you very much. Well, now it's time for you to make your statement on behalf of the Mayor. Uh, would you like to go ahead, please? Thank you very much. <coughs> In his report of phase one of the inquiry delivered on the 30th of October 2019, the chairman made recommendations which included identifying significant institutional and systemic issues that required change by the London Fire Brigade. The London Fire Brigade have been driving forward those necessary changes under the Mayor of London's oversight to ensure identified risks are being managed the recommendations from phase one are being implemented and the improvement measures achieve their intended outcomes. The evidence to be called in relation to module five will examine the operational response of the LFB on the night of the fire and will include an examination of where that response might have been lacking in coordination and effectiveness. The mayor does not seek to comment on that evidence nor on the expert reports in any detail, but he does wish to emphasise two points. First, the most important outcome for the bereaved survivors and residents, and indeed for all Londoners, is that the lessons of Grenville are learned and progressed quickly, so that they can be reassured that the terrible events of that night will not be repeated. Secondly, as the chairman was careful and right to emphasise, the issues that arose at Grenville in relation to the operational response of the London Fire Brigade were systemic and institutional rather than individual. Since the fire at Grenville, the government, governance of the London Fire Brigade has changed. At the time of the fire, the LFB was overseen by and accountable to the London Fire and Emergency Planning Authority, LFIPA. LFIPA has since been abolished, and from the 1st of April 2018, the London Fire Commissioner was established as a corporation sole, legally responsible for exercising the functions of the LFB. The London Fire Commissioner is a functional body of the Greater London Authority. The role of the Deputy Mayor for Fire and Resilience was also created. Under the new governance arrangements, the Mayor appoints the Deputy Mayor and the London Fire Commissioner, sets the London Fire Commissioner's budget and agrees its integrated risk management plan. Following the Phase 1 report, the Mayor appointed Andy Rowe as the Fire Commissioner. The inquiry will recall that Andy Rowe has first-hand knowledge of the issues that arose at Grenville, as he served as one of the incident commanders and was responsible for revoking the stay put advice and ordering the evacuation of the building. One of the benefits of the governance change is that there is a more direct oversight by the mayor. While the London Fire Commissioner has operational independence, the mayor has responsible for agreeing key London Fire Brigade strategies, monitoring performance and setting the budget. The deputy mayor has established a Fire and Resilience Board attended by senior staff from the LFB to support her in her duties. This enables monthly scrutiny of LFB's performance and provides an opportunity to challenge the LFB on its improvement work and for the Deputy Mayor to be consulted on major decisions. It also meets for deep dive sessions on specific issues that require particular scrutiny. Additionally, the GLA's oversight has been increased by the formation of its fire team, which supports the deputy mayor with his governance and assurance work. 18 months following the inquiry's phase one report, the deputy mayor is reviewing effectiveness to identify further possible improvements. The aim is to ensure that LFB's learning does not come only from external inspections and inquiries, but rather from the review and assurance processes, which should identify potential issues and is still a culture for continual improvement. The 
London Fire Commissioner, with the support of the Mayor, has published a transformation delivery plan to address the findings of the Phase 1 report and to transform the London Fire Brigade in terms of policy, procedure, culture and training. It addresses not only the recommendations of the Phase 1 report, but also takes into account the December 2019 inspection report from Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary and Fire and Rescue Services and considers the priorities for wider reform. To assist in this transformation, the London Fire Commissioner has reorganised the leadership of the London Fire Brigade, which includes, but is not limited to, the appointment of Richard Mills as Deputy Commissioner to oversee operational matters, Fiona Dolman as Director for Transformation to lead delivery of the London Fire Brigade's transformation programme, and Tim Powell as Director for People to lead improvements in training, organisational culture and diversity. To date, the London Fire Brigade has confirmed that it has completed 18 of the 29 recommendations aimed at the London Fire Brigade in the Phase 1 report. And the Mayor continues to ensure that the London Fire Brigade is taking timely action to implement the remainder of the inquiry's recommendations. While not commenting on the specifics, in preparing for Module 5, the GLA and the Deputy Mayor have reviewed the relevant expert evidence. London Fire Brigade has been undertaking a range of improvement work relating to, but not as a result of the issues raised by the experts as follows. Professor Chris Johnson has highlighted the need for a systemic approach to ensure resilient communications for firefighters on the ground. The LFB is in the process of procuring new radios and breathing apparatus, having identified this as being necessary on its own learnings from the Grenville Fire Tower, Grenville Tower Fire, and reviewed in the light of the inquiry's phase one report. The GLA has requested assurance to be undertaken to ensure that new systems fully address the need for an integrated and evidence-based approach to communication to ensure the safety of the firefighters and the public. Furthermore, and in accordance with the issues raised by Steve McCook on alternative approaches to firefighting in high-rise buildings, the London Fire Brigade have developed a new high-rise firefighting policy, which has now been implemented. Discussion about this policy demonstrated the challenging position the London Fire Brigade is in, as its consultation document included a procedure for firefighters to go beyond the bridgehead in breathing apparatus sets not started up, aiming to extend the opportunity to rescue residents affected by fire or smoke. Concerns expressed by the Brigade Union led to an extended consultation on the new policy and the establishment of an independent health and safety advisory panel whose recommendation to remove the procedure was implemented in the final policy. This highlights, Mr Chairman, the difficulty of balancing firefighters and resident safety in the current built environment. Central government have indicated that they will promulgate national guidance to support all fire and rescue services in relation to these changes in policy. However, in the continuing absence of a governmental or nationally agreed position, whether through the NFCC or the national FBU, the London Fire Commissioner has taken the steps he can to identify and implement measures intended to equip crews to undertake effective action or rescue in such exceptional and extreme circumstances where there is savable life. The final topic concerns Professor Torero, who's identified areas of concern in relation to fire safety inspections and the capabilities of operational commanders within the London Fire Brigade. These issues are being addressed by London Fire Brigade, for instance, in its revised policy on the management of operational risk information produced after the inquiry's phase one report. The deputy mayor has recently received a report from the London Fire Brigade's new Independent Operational Assurance Advisor on the revised policy, 
who's endorsed it both as a policy and how it's being applied. These issues are complex and multi-layered, and the Mayor is confident that the London Fire Brigade will build on the significant steps they've already taken to improve the planning and response to emergency incidents in high-rise buildings. Much has changed at the London Fire Brigade since the events being considered in this module. However, the Mayor is not complacent. Through his Deputy Mayor and with the assistance of the GLA Fire Team, London Fire Brigade performance is being scrutinised and challenged to ensure that it progresses the recommendations made as a result of the Phase 1 report and is responding appropriately to the need for improvement. The Mayor is also clear that there is more to do to strengthen assurance work, both within the LFB, where a new assurance framework is being implemented, and at the GLA. The Mayor publishes monthly Phase 1 recommendation and progress reports to ensure that the London Fire Commissioner and other organisations at which recommendations were directed remain transparently accountable to Londoners for making the improvements identified by your inquiry. The test of the transformation programme at LFB is how it works in practice, and a recent incident in London allowed for this to be examined. On the 7th of May 2021, the LFB attended a serious fire in a 19-storey block at the New Providence Wharf development in the London Borough of Tower Hamlets. While investigations into the fire are continuing, it appears that a fire breaking out in one flat spread to others via the building exterior. Around 125 firefighters attended the incident, with the first fire engine arriving at the scene approximately four minutes after the call to the London Fire Brigade. An evacuation of the block was carried out early in the incident, rescuing 35 people, with smoke hoods used to aid the evacuation and aerial appliances in attendance. London Fire Brigade's new fire survival guidance and evacuation and rescue policies, developed since the inquiry's phase one report, were implemented during the incident, ensuring, for instance, effective communication between the control room, the incident command and the bridgehead. The fire was under control within around two and a half hours. Two people were hospitalised, but there was no loss of life. This incident demonstrates London Fire Brigade's ability to act on the lessons from Grenville, but it also demonstrates that there remain significant fire risks in London's built environment. Although a tragedy on the scale of Grenville was avoided, in this case, the recurrence of a fire in similar circumstances clearly illustrates that there has undoubtedly been a failure of regulation and its implementation. London has many buildings which have been built or modified using unsafe materials, and there are additional problems with unsafe installations. The risk present in London's built environment remains high. Many buildings are subject to interim safety measures such as waking watch. The latest figures available at the time are that over a thousand buildings have changed from a stay put to a simultaneous evacuation strategy. The evidence that has been obtained as part of this inquiry has clearly demonstrated that the issues that arose at Grenville are far from unique to that building. Unfortunately, the greater understanding of increased risk gained in significant part as a result of this inquiry has not been sufficiently reflected in increased resources for fire and rescue services. Following the phase one report, the LFB received five and a half million pounds to carry out fire protection activity from the government. For 2021 to 22, the funding was reduced to 3.9 million, with no guarantee that the funding will continue in future years. The mayor is calling for this to become a permanent annual increase in funding from government until such time as London's built environment is safe. The period between 2009 and 2016 saw significant reductions in funding for the London Fire Brigade 
and the closure of 10 fire stations and the reduction of 27 appliances. An independent review commissioned by the current mayor shortly after his election in 2016 found that no further reduction could be considered. It is clear that there can be no further reduction to operational capacity while parts of the built environment in London continue to carry with them such significant risks. Ultimately, this is dependent on funding decisions made by central government. The mayor has prioritised the London Fire Brigade and funded it at levels higher than those to which he is resourced by central government, notwithstanding the financial constraints faced by him as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. It is by demonstrating a commitment to the learning from Grenville that we continue to place the BSRs central to the inquiry and its work, and to reassure them that much has changed and that change is continuing. Where there are more lessons to learn, the mayor will do his best to ensure that those two are addressed diligently. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Studd. Now, the <clears throat> next opening statement is going to be made by Mr. Martin Seward on behalf of the Fire Brigades Union. Mr. Seward, I can see you, I think. Yes, I can yes, see you. Can. And you can see us, I hope. Yes, indeed. Well, then, if you're ready to make your opening statement on behalf of the FBU, we should be pleased to hear you. Thank you, sir. And uh, fellow panel members and assessors, um, you have our written submissions, and we will not repeat these today. Um, you've already, and you are anyway, fully aware of the issues that are going to be canvassed in Module 5. I won't read out the list, but they all concern the Fire and Rescue Services. This renewed focus on the Fire and Rescue Services should be kept in proper perspective. The Grenfell Tower disaster was an extreme event. It was caused by the failures of government, organisations and persons who had nothing to do with the Fire and Rescue Service, although this was regrettably facilitated by the failure of those in leading positions within the service to challenge or make the case for public and firefighter safety. This was a major failing of, fire, of chief fire officers and their organisations and of those who advised government on fire policy. I will list the five main causes as the FBU sees it. Firstly, the not fit for purpose regulatory regime that left the door open to the failed design and build of the refurbishment, e.g. removing fire certificates, the demeaning of health and safety in favour of business interests and the constant pressure to cut red tape, the one in one out and then one in two out. Secondly, the refurbishers, the owners, um, RBKC and TMO, the design team, fire engineers, manufacturers of cladding materials and the construction industry, which variously gained the system and failed to think fire, and between them installed a new rain screen cladding system, which rendered the tower a combustible death trap and failed to provide correlative fire safety me measures. Thirdly, stay put. This is a feature of building design and is not the creation of the fire and rescue service. It should never have been applied to Grenfell Tower after the refurbishment uh, destroyed its comp compartmentation mainly by installing a combustible rain screen cladding system. In light of what we now know, the building should not have been occupied at all with a stay put evacuation strategy. Fourthly, the LFB was not advised of the increased fire risk presented by the new rain screen cladding system on Grenfell Tower following the refurbishment and was unaware of its capacity to cause rapid insidious fire spread over the whole of the building inside and out. The total building failure at Grenfell Tower put firefighters in an unprecedented, impossible situation on the night of the fire uh, that we know as the Grenfell Tower disaster. If I can turn, sir, to the order of modules, um, the, the intense focus on the emergency response in phase one, and now again in modules five and six of phase two, risks losing this perspective. The FBU asks inquiry to look at the underlying systemic causes of the Grenfell Tower disaster, avoid condemning individuals in the LFB, and recognise that the LFB was trying its best to provide a service to keep the public safe from fire in face of acute challenges by the government. These challenges include 
Firstly, deregulation, which limited the extent to which new building materials and methods could be understood, regulated, and taken into account for firefighting purposes. Secondly, austerity cuts, which reduced staff numbers in key public sector departments, including building control, fire safety departments, operational crews, and control. Thirdly, attempts at privatization, draining already limited resources. Fourthly, the government's fragmentation of the fire and rescue service, and then providing insufficient national leadership, guidance and scrutiny from ministers, the DCOG and chief fire officers in the, in the Chief Fire Officers Association, which later became the, the uh, National Fire Chiefs Council, the NFCC. These failings originate because of the failed government policy and the failure of the then Mayor of London, now Prime Minister, and Chief Fire Officers to stand up for the service, for public safety and for standards, resulting in a failure to identify emerging risks, a failure to plan adequately to respond to those risks, a failure to protect the service, see particularly the cuts imposed on the fire inspecting officers. The FBO has believed from the outset that the inquiry could better assess firefighting procedure and training after looking first at all the regulatory and guidance context within which the fire and rescue services developed their policies and procedures. The lack of national guidance in respect of evacuation is well known to, to all those who listen to the inquiry. The FBU asks note be taken also of the dearth of national guidance under Section 21 of the Fire and Rescue Services Act 2004, or otherwise, on other issues of importance to all fire and rescue services. Notably, there was no national guidance to local fire and rescue services, including London, on the requirements of, for responsible persons to prepare evacuation plans, especially PEEPs, the problems facing fire and rescue services in the fields of communications, the growing risk of new building materials and the increasing prevalence of rain screen cladding, cladding systems on existing, often old, high-rise residential buildings, the increasingly prevalent breaches of compartmentation in existing high-rise, despite universal dependence on stay put, and failing to advise on the recommendations to retrofit, retrofit sprinklers. Sorry, I've, um, I seem to have lost my place here. I've just uh, pressed return and it's all disappeared. It'll come back in a minute. So I was, I was looking at the uh, lack of national guidance and citing some examples. Uh, so I'd mentioned on the recommendations uh, to, to re retrofit sprinklers and also on the requirements for responsible persons to prepare evacuation plans, especially personal emergency evacuation plans, and on the various recommendations made by coroners and other proper authority following earlier tragedies, as well as on when and how to evacuate in, 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 a, in a fire. The FBU has read the criticisms, some trenchant of the London Fire Brigade, which are made in other opening submissions and agrees there have been significant failings in the fire and rescue service. These failings do not lie with the firefighters in local stations, control room staff, or with local fire safety teams, nor do they lie with the FBU, which has challenged these failings every step of the way. But module five will be heard before much of the relevant evidence, including oral examination of the experts and the senior fire officers, including the present London Fire Commission and his two immediate predecessors. The FBI urges all those listening to the inquiry hearings, including especially the panel, not to pass judgment on the fire and rescue service, and particularly the individuals therein, before hearing all the evidence and considering the wider picture outlined above. The LFB is not a failed service. It has continued to provide a good service in face of the destructive effect of ministers' deregulatory agenda, privatisation, um, e.g. in the control room, and austerity cuts. The FBU reserves its position on all Module 5 issues until closing submissions. We ask the inquiry to consider leaving closing submissions for Module 5 until the end of Module 6, so that the core participants can consider all the evidence adduced in these two modules when finalising their submissions on the overlapping issues to be covered. The inquiry does not currently propose to call the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, to testify about his period as Mayor of London nor to call Matt Rack, General Secretary of the FBU. 
We urge the panel to keep an open mind on the desirability of calling both these witnesses in module six. As to the former mayor, he repeatedly overrode the London Assembly to impose swinging cuts on the LFP. As to Matt Rack, firefighters, particularly operational crews, will otherwise have no one to speak for them in modules five and six. Moving on to the role of the FBU, it may assist those listening to these submissions to explain briefly what the FBU does. The FBU is a trade union, a voluntary organization of workers funded entirely by member subscriptions. 90% plus of, of, fire, of UK firefighters belong to the union, including control staff and officers. The union negotiates and collectively bargains with employers on, on their behalf on pay, hours, conditions, pensions, health and safety, discipline. It represents individuals who suffer injuries or have other problems arising out of their work and the bereaved families of firefighters who die in the line of duty, whose numbers have tragically risen dramatically over the last 20 years. It also represents the voice of firefighters with ministers, mayors, other politicians, uh, chief fire officers and their national bodies. The FBU campaigns for investment in the fire and rescue service and for wider issues, e.g. on climate change. The FBU has campaigned to modernise and to improve standards in the UK fire and rescue service for the benefit of its own members and of the wider public for more than 100 years. However, the FBU wants to make it clear it's not in charge of the fire and rescue service it ought not to be conflated with the management of the Fire and Rescue Service in London or nationally. On the contrary, the FBU was formed in London precisely in order to defend and promote firefighters' conditions against LFB management. And especially in recent years, the FBU has often been attacked, ignored, excluded by management and government. For example, since 2004, the FBU has been excluded from participating in official bodies like the Central Fire Brigade's Advisory Council and the Building Regulations Advisory Committee. It has been so excluded both by the restructuring of 2004, which deprived the FBU of its statutory right and duty to participate at this level, and by the attitude of those administering these bodies thereafter. In particular, the FBU has had no legal responsibility to look out for emerging risks like cladding. That was the responsibility of the building owners and clients, those engaged in the cladding industry. The government, particularly the DCLG, the regulatory bodies under the building regulations, the Housing Act and the Fire Safety Order, such as the BRE, the BBA, Building Control, Housing Authorities and Fire and Rescue Services and the national bodies of the Fire and Rescue Service, such as uh, CFRA, CFOA, and NFCC. Within the LFB or any Fire and Rescue Service, it was no part of any firefighter or control room staff's responsibility to look out for such emerging risks in the built environment. Turning, if I may, to the calls for the wholesale restructure of the Fire and Rescue Service. Core participants and some experts in their submissions to this module have called for the wholesale restructure of the Fire and Rescue Service. The, the FBU wants to ensure that the lessons of Grenfell Tower are learned, that a similar horror never occurs again, and supports the work of organisations like Inquest that have called for a national oversight body to ensure that recommendations made at the inquest and inquiries are implemented. We agree such improvements are needed in the FRS and call for the highest professional standards in the service. That is what the FBU campaigns for daily. As a trade union, it has consistently called for reforms, for improvements in standards and training. However, it is the experience of the FBU that so-called reforms in the Fire and Rescue Service have, rather than improved, eroded the fire service, a process that has been echoed across the public services in the UK. We urge that these reforms imposed from above and not challenged by the leadership of the Fire and Rescue Service, ought to be fully investigated by the panel. The last attempt at wholesale restructuring of the Fire and Rescue Service in 2004 resulted in firstly the abolition of national standards of fire cover and emergency response and their replacement with the locally determined integrated risk management planning process, uh, which I refer to as the IRMP process. Secondly, the failure of that IRMP process, which was hopelessly fettered by its link to budgeting and became inextricably tangled in the struggle of hard-pressed local authorities to make savings in face of austerity cuts. 
Decisions about the provision of fire and rescue services across the country were driven not by risk assessment as they should have been, but by the need to find savings in austerity. This has led to huge cuts to funding, leading to significant reductions in staffing, including in specialist fire safety teams. Thirdly, the resulting and near constant attempts to cut the numbers of staff, equipment and stations to alter terms and conditions of service to avoid the payment of pension benefits played out in 47 different brigades have absorbed the efforts of local authorities, senior management and the FBU and distracted them from new challenges confronting the fire and rescue service. Fourthly, sideline and ignoring the FBU wherever possible instead of engaging fully with representatives of the workforce. Fifthly, the abolition of national appointment and promotion standards. And sixthly, um, the abolition of, the, of Her Majesty's Fire and in Services Inspectorate. The FBU contends this led to the consequential dearth of research, development and national guidance for brigades into common problems, some central to the GTI, including those listed above. The FBU contends that the new national bodies that arose have failed to speak truth to power and as a result have played a leading role in downgrading fire safety, leaving the public at risk. CIFRA, CIFA and NFCC did not address issues highlighted by fires where compartmentation failed for various reasons, including the need for national research and development of solutions to the national problems of how to evacuate a high rise, how to communicate effectively when fighting fire in a high rise, and how to augment uh, water flow to achieve a sufficient flow rate. Neither did they press the DCLG for the resources to carry out this work properly. On communications, they failed to address the fundamental problems as set out by Professor Johnson and produced no national guidance to benefit all fire and rescue services, instead leaving the work to individual fire and rescue services to struggle ineffectively with this recurring problem. They failed to advise government on the need to revise its guidance under Section 21 of the Fire and Rescue Services Act 2004, the, the Fire and Rescue National Framework, and on the failure of the IRMP process properly to assess risk. Instead, the IRMP was used, as I've said, purely as a budgetary device to make year-on-year -year savings. In short, these reforms only made things worse, hindering the efforts of firefighters to tackle high-rise fires. Moving on to uh, Steve McGurk. The FBU opposed Steve McGurk's appointment as the firefighting expert to the inquiry and is critical of his report. His report says evacuation was possible, but he doesn't explain how it could have been done. He has sidestepped that difficult question, how would you do it, by agreeing with the chairman that firefighters should have made it up on the night. He is part of the problem. He was as chief fire officer from 99 until 2015. He was also president of CIFO just before the Lackanoff House fire in 2009. He was a leading national figure among chief fire officers and an advisor to the local government association uh, between 2009 and 2014 when it produced its guidance on high-rise building fire safety. He also chaired the practitioners forum during its brief existence. Neither Mr McGurk nor his, his two brigades developed learning on evacuation and stay put or assessed risks of catastrophic building failure or warned government of cladding risks, or challenge the deregulation of the fire safety and the building control regime, or alert government to its dangers. He must therefore submit to the FBU be held to account himself for the failure of CFOA and the NFCC to assess the risks of catastrophic building failure, and to warn ministers of the dangers of cladding and related ha hazards. He should be asked why CFOA oversaw a deregulated fire safety regime, failed to warn ministers or the public, that such a regime was likely to lead to, to a disaster. <coughs> On evacuation specifically, Mr McGurk agrees with the chairman's conclusion that by 1.30 at the earliest and 1.50 at the latest, it was clear that revoking the stay put strategy in place and moving to attempt to evacuate the tower was the only realistic way of minimising loss of life and serious injury and that steps ought to have been taken to carry this out. He so agrees, notwithstanding he acknowledges there was no national operation, gu operational guidance or direction that provides advice as to how to evacuate a high-rise building. And um, he's, he reports no practical guidance in the UK as to how evacuation should be carried out, saying, I've also considered a number of international procedures, but here too, I've not located any explicit operational evacuation procedures. Um, so there are still no agreed 
uh, operational guidance four years after the fire. The firefighters on the night had, to, had no procedure and no training for such a situation. On the other hand, they did have a procedure and training in the defend in place strategy for high rise with a staple evacuation strategy and they carried it out. Therefore, the FBU contends the firefighters on the scene cannot be blamed or criticized for any failure to evacuate. Turning now to Professor Torero on not blaming the fire service. Professor Torero delivered a lecture at the Warren Center Fire Safety Engineering Project in Australia on the 24th of July, 2018, when he expressed why it is wrong to blame firefighters and the fire and rescue service for the Grenfell Tower disaster. I'm quoting him directly now. What ended up happening in Grenfell was that the engineers delivered the building. Those engineers did not exercise competency adequately. Their competence was not consistent with the complexity of what they were doing. And they delivered a building on fire to the fire service that the fire service could not manage. It wasn't the fire service failure to address the problem of the building. It's our failure to actually deliver the building that the firefighters could actually work on. So the expectation that the fire service should have understood building performance, the expectation that the fire service should have been able to manage the fire is a really unfair expectation. Nevertheless, today we're sitting in front of the television, watching the testimony, testimonies of the firefighters at Grenfell, and we're blaming them for what they were not able to handle. We expected them to come and fix the problem for us. We created the mess and they couldn't fix the problem. And now we want to blame them. Professor Torero now calls for reforms of the Fire and Rescue Service. The FBU agrees a change of culture is needed, particularly for ministers, policy advisors, and CFOs, and, and uh, chief fire officers nationally and at local level, to confront, not avoid, difficult issues like communications problems, and to learn from recommendations made by proper authority, usually following earlier tragedies. The way to restore a Fire and Rescue Service which lives up to these rightfully high expectations and retains public confidence is A, to establish national institutions with meaningful trade union representation to assure appropriate guidance is developed and given to local fire and rescue services, and B, to secure adequate resources for local fire and rescue services to discharge their functions. Such national institutions might include, as has been recommended by Professor Johnson, for example, a national framework for fire safety research, a national framework for operational firefighting research, a National Fire Safety Investigation Board, a modern equivalent of the Central Advi Fire Brigade's Advisory Council, um, a national statutory body to include genuine trade union representation. But if reforms mean private sector takeover, attacking the workforce and blaming the victims, that will let those in power off the hook and fail to confront the building crisis. Moving on, sir, to Dr. Paul Grimwood, the, the FBU respects Dr. Grimwood's work and notes that he himself recognises that the practical application of the Rice mnemonic to a situation such as Grenfell is necessarily limited. Dr. Grimwood says, it is important to emphasise that Rice is not a policy or procedure, but a command decision-making tool. It is primarily an aid memoir used to alleviate command stress and prompt a predetermined, rapid analytical thought process. It was not an alternative evacuation policy. The pro forma Kent Standard Operating Procedure, uh, known as the Kent SOP, bears no indication that it had actually been adopted by Kent or any other fire and rescue service by the time of the Grenfell Tower disaster, or even now. The National Fire Brigade Union were not consulted about the pro forma Kent SOP and received no information from any FBU representatives in the Southeast region about it. If Kent or any fire and rescue service had sought to implement the pro forma Kent SOP, they would have been obliged to consult with the FBU because of the increased risk to firefighters if required to work above a fire in a high rise residential building. Subject to evidence that might emerge in module five, it's unlikely that the pro forma Kent SOP was introduced as a procedure before the Grenfell Tower fire and more likely that it remained a, a pro forma. Neither uh, uh, the Kent SOP nor Rice um, provides help for vulnerable people with mobility problems and may lead to injuries and deaths of firefighters. In any event, 
firefighters and control staff whom we represent in this inquiry and their FBU representatives, both in London and national, were unaware of the rice mnemonic or the pro forma chem salt until long after the fire. There are still no national guidelines on evacuation. Since the fire, the, Lon um, the, the London Fire Commission has introduced a revised PN633, which um, Anne Stud QC referred to a few moments ago, which would have required firefighters to work above the fire in a high rise without starting up their breathing apparatus sets and has been accepted as has been the accepted safety practice for more than half a century. The FBU have highlighted the unacceptable risks to firefighters' health and safety, which the new policy endorsed. The FBU's concerns were upheld by an independent arbitrator. The London Fire Commissioner accepted the finding of the arbitrator and modified the proposed procedure, which is now being introduced in London. This is to, to the credit of both the, the LFC and the FBU, both of whom have listened and learned from this inquiry and are determined to improve the, the fire and rescue service, including the operational response to high-rise buildings. Those who wish to demean health and safety may see the FBU's intervention as obstructive or being difficult, whereas it was in fact both reasonable and well-founded and born out of the FBU's long experience of supporting bereaved families of firefighters who died fighting fire, including in high-rise buildings, for example, Shirley Towers and Parrot Court. The LFB should not be blamed for failing to devise uh, an evacuation policy. As we submitted in phase one, and as remains the FBU's understanding, no other fire and rescue service had an evacuation plan at the time of the fire, notably not Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service, where Mr McGurk was the chief fire officer from 2009 to 15. Even now, over four years after the fire, the National Steering Group set up by the Home Office, MHCLG and the NFCC to implement the Chairman's Recommendation 12A has still not reported with national guidelines for evacuating high-rise. The Chairman recommended that the government develop national guidelines for carrying out partial or total evacuations of high-rise, such guidelines to include the means of protecting fire exit routes and procedures for evacuating persons who are unable to use the stairs in an emergency or who may require assistance, such as disabled people, older people, and young children. So far, very little has been provided, little detail has been provided about the work of this steering group. See, for example, the last update, update of March 2021. Ensuring excellent standards in the fire rescue service needs the sustained commitment and, and leadership of central government to set and maintain standards. In light of this delay, the four years delay since the fire and, and two years since the chairman's recommendation. The FBU asks, how can watch manager Dalton possibly be criticized for not having devised an evacuation plan for Grenfell Tower on that terrible night? Turning then to the criticism in, in your phase one report, sir, um, the criticism of watch manager Dalton for not deciding to revoke stakeholder to move to total evacuation of the tower by 150. The FBU submits that some of the chairman's findings in his phase one report relating to the actions of firefighters on the night of the fire may need to be revisited in light of the evidence heard in phase two. One such finding is the criticism of Dowden for failing to evacuate the tower by 150 when he handed over control to station manager Walton. The chairman found it was or should have been obvious that only a supervised mass evacuation would minimize the number of ca casualties and he, he describes the, the same window. By 150 at the latest, uh, reported, uh, found the chairman, at the latest he should have realized that the fire had begun to enter the interior of the building, the compartmentation which underpins the statement of advice had been breached. In those circumstances, he should have spoken to operations manager Norman in the control room and have obtained the most recent information, should have decided to evacuate the building and set about ensuring through the control room that all calls from the building were told to leave come what may. This is a finding which the firefighting community whom I represent, both FBU members who attended or were on duty that night and the FBU and its wider membership. And so far as I'm aware, the employer, the NFB or, or the London Fire Commissioner, finding which they cannot accept. It is not out of any disrespect for the chairman or for the process of the inquiry, but from their own knowledge and experience, they believe that watch manager Dowden and his senior colleagues around him at the instant crowd should not be criticised 
for not ordering a full evacuation of the town by 1.50. We wrote to the inquiry on the 9th of August 2019, itemising some of the difficulties with a supervised mass evacuation. I won't repeat those here. The FBU respectfully submits that Watch Manager Dowden neither knew nor should have known some of the key factors which the chairman uh, considered should have triggered his revocation of statehood and, and started in planning to evacuate the tower. So these key factors. Oh, I'm about to run out of battery. Anyway. Oh, that's right. So. Crisis averted. Um, so, turning to those factors, so um, Watch Manager Dowden did not know the cladding fire had spread out of control by 1.50. The spread of fire was unusual since other fires of this kind had tended to burn out after reaching the top of the building. Watch Manager Dowden and his colleagues could not have predicted the rapid fire development, specifically that fire would race across the crown and accelerate lateral fire spread. Untrained in how to fight cladding fires, he continued to expect the fire would be extinguished by firefighting operations and was still planning to fire at 1.50 when he handed over command. Watch Manager Dowden could not reasonably have been expected to know his firefighting plan could not succeed until after he had at least seen the ineffectiveness of the aerial, which didn't start applying water until about 1.47 and continued thereafter until 2.05. If an aerial had been included in the PDA, Mr. Dowden may have learned of the futility of trying to fight the external fire over 20 minutes before it became apparent on the night. Moreover, Watch Manager Dowden and his colleagues on the night were not provided with the tools to enable him to make or then to suggest that decision which had never been made before in the Fire and Rescue Service, let alone by a watch manager. The chairman has found institutional failures. These cannot be laid at the door of Mr. Dowden and his colleagues on the night, for all the reasons I've outlined. Additional to the systemic failings already cited, essentially the lack of an evacuation procedure, policy or training in it. There was no responsible person's evacuation plan prepared by RBKC or the TMO, not even vulnerable persons, nor any practical guidance or even information about who or in which flat such persons were, nor any training or drills, for instance, on how to evacuate the building, which would have identified safe places to gather and practice special arrangements for vulnerable people. There was no training on how to go about conducting a Section 72D visit on how the materials used in exterior facades might behave in fires, and Mr. Dowden could not be expected to assess the risks created by the cladding system or how they might relate to other aspects of the building's fire safety measures, nor when to bring in the expertise of a fire risk assessor to assist with that task, nor how to assess the risks thereby uncovered. These were failings of the LFB senior management, not of Mr. Dowden. His training didn't equip him to understand the nature of the fire or how best to combat or contain it, nor did it equip him to decide whether to undertake an evacuation or how best to do so, nor how to evaluate the situation, revoke state or plan an evacuation and then implement it. As the chairman has found, the knowledge that high-rise buildings are constructed on the basis of effective compartmentation itself created a barrier to thinking about evacuation. And so if he had considered revoking state or moving to evacuation, he would have had to improvise to carry it out improvise in face of formidable practical difficulties and despite the dangers that would arise, including a risk to life. The reduced frequency which firefighters have been called upon to attend operational incidents was not compensated by any increased training, let alone realistic training. In addition to the formidable difficulties impeding evacuation, as found by the chairman, uh, for example, there being no reliable way to communicate with the residents, should be added the unavailability of a fire lift, which deprived crews of the chance to get to the upper floors quickly if the lift, and materially limited the height to which firefighters could physically travel to initiate or assist with evacuation. Professor Johnson reports on the unreliable communication systems used on the night. This, the, the, the problems were already known to the chairman and all who listened to the evidence in phase one, but Professor Johnson has explained how these communication failures led to reduced situation awareness. Importantly, BA crews up the tower were unable reliably if at all to communicate with Bridgehead, nor Bridgehead with the incident commander, and vice versa. 
there were adjustments that could have been made, could have been made, e.g., to reconfigure the barrier headsets to use their more powerful UHF radio. Um, but the firefighters were not trained to do this. Watch manager O'Keefe pointedly lamented that he could have done with an airwave radio. Examples of early communications failures are legion, but a few illustrate the point. By early, I mean in the period up until 1.50. During the attempt to rescue Jessica on floor 20, between 1.34 and 1.57, firefighter Dorgu tried unsuccessfully to radio Bridgehead, but couldn't get through. Watch manager Dowden did not know of any FSG calls until after 1.35, when the first admin call to CU8 started. And not until the first list of um, three FSG calls was thereafter taken by watch manager Kentfield to Dowden when he was talking to, to station manager Loft. And that's estimated at about 1.40. The initial service requests sent to the instant command pump had not been picked up and there was no digital record of them. The instant command pump wasn't manned because all the firefighters were busy elsewhere. Firefighters Cornelius and Murphy, the first crew deployed by the bridgehead to respond to an FSG call at around 1.51, tried repeatedly to contact the bridgehead on their handheld radios to say that they would not be able to bring the people down, but they received no answer and heard no radio traffic. They didn't debrief uh, to a bridgehead until around 2.19, their end of wear time. So Mr. Dowden was unaware before 1.50 that the BA deployments to rescue FSG callers had been unsuccessful uh, and, uh, and had, they had been unable to reach the uppermost floors. He reasonably tasked station manager Loft with coordinating the emergency response to FSG calls in line with procedure PN790 and as discussed with station manager Loft. He couldn't have been expected, we submit, to obtain information about the success of search and rescue deployments in response to FSG calls before he handed over command at about 1.50. Um, we respectfully say that's contrary to the Chairman's finding at paragraph 28.21 of the Phase 1 report. Having tried but failed to radio the bridgehead, Crew Manager Stern and Firefighter Hibble later informed Watch Manager O'Keefe at the bridgehead at about 1.38 of the poor conditions on on floor 16, you'll remember the, 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 the vivid description, it's fucked, and of the failure, uh, the failed rescue attempt on floor 16, with one person still unaccounted for. Watch manager Dowden denies learning this critical information, which was likely due to communications problems. At his handover to station manager Walton, shortly after 1.50, watch manager Dowden didn't have information about any of the operations inside the tower, and there was too much traffic on the radio to get a message to the bridge. This is likely to be true because watch manager Dowden was a patently honest witness, and because there were difficulties communicating from outside the tower to the bridgehead. In light of all the circumstances, including the new factors identified above, the FBU respectfully asks the chairman and all the panel, as he and they think fit, think fit to review his, his criticism of watch manager Dowden for not deciding to revoke statehood and move to evacuate before 1.50. It was not obvious. On the contrary, it ran counter to all his training and experience. Concluding comments. Any future reform of the Fire and Rescue Service must be the result of proper engagement with and consultation of the unions representing the workforce. The FBU fully supports upskilling people who do the work of the FRS from top down. It fully supports the greater integration of the fire safety department into proper pre-planning and preparation for operational response. It fully supports the proposals for achieving better communications at instant, better use of existing water supplies, centralization of fire service research, independent incident investigation, and the collation of reports. But the FBU warns that further structural reform of the Fire and Rescue Service will be seized upon by central government as an opportunity for further cuts, for further privatisation of parts of the Fire and Rescue Service, and to bring in business leaders who may not themselves have been exposed to all the dangers of firefighting, and who may therefore appear to, or actually will, underestimate the value of health and safety which the FBU has fought for over 100 years to promote. The public services sector is unsuited to, private, to privatisation as seen in the probation and prison services. Yet it is repeatedly attempted in the Fire and Rescue Service, e.g. the failed attempts to privatise the management of the LFB's fleet of vehicles with ASICCO going into liquidation, 
or to privatise control rooms, which ended in chaos, wasting millions of pounds, taking up valuable control staff time along the way, as explained by Scott Hayward and Joe Smith in their witness statements in Module 5, and as exposed by the National Audit Commission. The Fireworks Union calls on the inquiry to assess the corrosive effect of the restructuring the Fire and Rescue Service has been subjected to in recent years by investigating um, the effects of fragmentation of the dearth of national research and, and resulting guidance and of austerity cuts on the Fire and Rescue Service over the last 15 years. Those who oversaw these destructive changes cited above should not continue to be the architects of further reform. The FBU actively supports such um, positive change when possible. It has done so in the past, for example, in developing generic risk assessments like GRA 3.2 for high-rise fighting, in the development of community fire safety work and dynamic risk assessments, in welcoming women and people from ethnic minorities into the fire and risk service, encouraging equal treatment and challenging discrimination, and will do in the future. The FBU believes there is a need for major change and improvement in the fire and risk service and has made this case for many years. The union is committed to such changes to improve public safety and the ability of firefighters to prevent fires and respond safely and effectively when fires happen. Thank you, sir, and your colleagues for uh, allowing us to make this statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Seward. <clears throat> the next statement is going to be made by Mr. Louis Brown, Queen's Counsel, on behalf of the Fire Officers Association. Mr. Brown, <clears throat> do I have you there? He I'm here, sir. I can see you and your colleagues, and I can hear you. Good. We can see you and hear you now. So, um, well, we're ready for you to make your statement. If you'd like to do that now, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. While it is recognised that the chairman made findings in his phase one report relating to the action of firefighters on the night of the fire, we respectfully submit that those findings may need to be re-evaluated, depending upon the evidence heard in this module and in module six. Accordingly, uh, and insofar as specifically relevant to uh, um, the Fire Officers Association and Richard Welsh, emphasis will again be placed on the wholly impossible situation of firefighters and those in command faced on the night of the fire. The following must be very carefully borne in mind. Those in LFB command positions inside and outside the tower were motivated solely by taking decisions that would, in their honestly held view, facilitate the rescue of those trapped in the tower. In considering the actions of all LFB personnel on the night, it must at all times be borne in mind that this tragedy was wholly unprecedented in its scale and complexity and the enormous challenges it posed. The fire was a multi-storey external fire that caused a multi-storey internal fire. And crucially, on the night of the fire, none of the firefighters, including those in command positions, had any knowledge that the tower was clad in such highly combustible rain screen cladding. The evidence given by all firefighters who commented upon it was that the fire at the tower was wholly outside the experience of all personnel who attended. Turning then, sir, please, to the condition of the tower immediately before the fire. Dr Lane's opinion is cogent on these issues. In her supplemental report, she states as follows, Based on the relevant test evidence, the construction materials forming the cladding, when considered either individually or as an assembly, did not comply with the recommended fire performance in ADB 2013 as applicable. The entire system could not adequately resist the spread of fire over the walls, having regard, having regard to its height, use, and position of the building. Specifically, the assembly failed adequately to resist the spread of fire to an extent that supported the required stay put strategy for the tower. The assembly failed adequately to resist the spread of fire to an extent that supported the required internal firefighting, defend in place firefighting regime. The cladding presented an extreme and primary hazard. In the event of any internal fire starting near a window, there was a disproportionately high probability of the fire spread into the cladding. The type of materials in the cladding and how they were arranged around the window in the kitchen contributed to the speed at which the fire spread from the flat of fire origin to a multi-storey external fire within the rain screen system. The consequence of this was that any individual flat of fire origin was no longer in a separate fire rated box as required, 
the compartmentation required in the building was breached by the ability of the fire to spread on the external wall from that compartmented flat to the next. The required single safety condition, stay put, was not provided for as was required as a result of the system installed during the refurbishment. Dr. Lane did not consider it reasonable that in the event of the installation of a combustible rain screen system on a high rise residential building, the fire brigade should be expected to fully mitigate any resulting fire event. This was particularly so where the fire brigade had never been informed that a combustible rain screen system had been installed. Her overall conclusion was that there were multiple catastrophic fire routes created by the construction, form and construction detailing that was used. The cladding as configured at the tower rendered it unsuitable for a stay put policy. Once fire was within the cladding, there was nothing to impede the spread of fire and smoke around the building. And this, in her words, created a condition for a catastrophic fire event to occur. As stated, none of those were matters that those making command decisions on the night were aware of. The single stair lobbies and the fire safety provisions therein were not ever designed to create a safe escape route or a safe working environment in a whole building fire. The design approach for high rise residential buildings is, 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 is or ought to have been based upon inhibiting that from occurring. The net effect of all of this is that those LFB personnel taking command decisions on the night had no prior opportunity to consider their firefighting and rescue tactics, as well as any evacuation guidance to the residents having regard to how the fire was likely to behave or spread once on the exterior of the building. The impossible scale and nature of the task facing both residents and firefighters that night was encapsulated by Dr. Lane in her supplemental report when she said uh, that it was her opinion that the conditions created difficult and at times life-threatening conditions for the LFB. The conditions greatly restricted their ability to implement the standard processes and procedures regarding firefighting once the fire spread beyond flats 16. Further, the single escape stairs and its lobbies became the single most important life safety feature. The failure of this life safety feature meant that after 0140, in particular 2 a.m., Worsening conditions limited the ability for rescue to occur and created more and more barriers or perceived barriers uh, for residents to overcome in order to self-evacuate. Since the stay put strategy is a safety uh, building design condition, the LFB and its officers in command reasonably relied upon this building design condition on the night of the fire. There is no building design function in a high rise residential building provided to enable firefighters in the UK to communicate any change in their evacuation or rescue guidance from within the building. Then please, sir, just uh, um, some points concerning Mr. Welsh's role as fire safety commander on the night. Uh, as you know, he arrived at the bridgehead at, at 2.16. At that time, it was on the second floor. He spoke with uh, watch manager O'Keefe and watch manager De Silvo concerning uh, their plans. He was satisfied that the, the plans were the correct strategy and appeared to be operating successfully. Watch manager O'Keefe requested Mr. Welsh to obtain all available EDBA resources, and this he did by communicating that to the fire ground, with, via fire ground radio uh, with CU8. He ensured that when the bridgehead was moved to the third floor, FSG information which had been collated on the second floor, the results of FSG calls were transferred to a wall on the third floor, he satisfied himself that calls with FSG calls were being processed properly, and when sufficient information was to hand, prioritization was given to the rescue of the young and the elderly. According to uh, Mr. Welsh, there was not a point when there was insufficient numbers of EDBA wearers to be deployed safely into the tower. At the point in time when he was fire sec safety, uh, forgive me, fire sector commander, there were frequent difficulties in firefighters being able to reach higher floors. And it was for this reason that he did not consider that stay put should be abandoned. The conditions would have been, to use his words, unsurvivable. And further, conditions were, again, using his words, getting worse by the minute. When the bridgehead, <clears throat> forgive me, the decision to abandon stay put was, com was communicated by Mr. Welsh to a GM Cook at a point when the bridgehead was on the ground floor and so after 3.08. 
at about 4 a.m. or thereabouts, Mr. Welsh and GM Goldborn devised and implemented a plan for systematic searching. This involved committing SDBA wearers for firefighting, starting on the floor of the fire, and then pushing EDBA wearers to get as high as they could in the building. Despite the conditions, firefighters attempted to push as high up the tower as was possible. In addition, uh, Mr. Welsh attempted the use of positive pressure ventilation. However, that did not work. The use of secondary BA sets was not a viable option to assist residents who needed rescuing and with, assistant, uh, with, uh, with assisting and evacuating the tower. Uh, and that was for these reasons. Firstly, they were not designed for that purpose. Secondly, they are not for use in firefighter emergencies. Three were declared that night. And thirdly, there was an insufficiency of secondary sets. Can I then move on, please, sir, to deal with uh, some comments concerning Mr. McGurk's report, uh, and in particular, the uh, comment that he makes at page 61, paragraphs 166 to 167, that there was no request to mobilize either a high volume pumping unit, HVP, or hose laying vehicle, uh, even as a precautionary measure. It is our submission that even had such a request been made, no operational advantage could have accrued due to the locations involved, traffic conditions, and the following. The nearest HVP was stationed at Barnet at a distance of over 13 miles from the tower. Given the traffic conditions and the speeds likely to be achieved, this would imply 20 to 30 minutes travel to the incident. Additional time would be required in locating and being briefed by the incident commander, identifying a suitable water source, planning the route and deployment to that water source. In the case of Grenfell Tower, the closest sustainable and inexhaustible open water supply uh, was the Grand Union Canal. Secondly, on deployments, the pumping unit would be located by the canal. Uh, that would be approximately a mile from the incident. As the pump carries two kilometers of hose, a supplementary hose box would be required to secure the supply. Locating that unit would have been virtually impossible given the gridlock in surrounding roads and streets. Uh, that was extensive and impenetrable. There can be no doubt in our submission that an operation to lay one mile of hose along uh, uh, the uh, route uh, would have proved impossible and necessitated a lengthy operation, potentially delaying any delivery of water to the tower by a further two hours at least. Next, a hose laying lorry would encounter similar issues as this vehicle also lays 90 millimeters hose from the back of the vehicle as it drives along therefore needing a clear carriageway. This vehicle could not operate effectively in gridlock conditions. Again, had an HVP been successfully deployed, the first delivery of water to the tower would have been delayed by hours. As regards the Kent Fire and Rescue Standard Operating Procedure, the SOP, as has been pointed out by Mr. Seawood, RICE 2 is simply a prompt or mnemonic. It is not a policy or procedure and offers no practical advice on how a full or partial evacuation is to be achieved in any situation. Certainly after 158, RICE was of extremely limited relevance to the situation at the tower since. In the initial stages of the fire, which began on the fourth floor, 80% of the occupants were above the, the uh, fire ground. Adopting the RICE model, floors five and six might have been considered primary areas needing to be evacuated due to an imminent danger from the fire. However, in the time required to evacuate those floors, the speed and ferocity of fire spread was such that, in the meantime, many parts of the stairwell would have been compromised. The core activity underlying RICE is the maintenance of the integrity of the means of escape, and that was not achievable. Given the speed and ferocity of fire spread, it would not have been possible to determine, firstly, how the various parts of the stairwell, all subject to fluctuating conditions, might be protected and by whom, and secondly, how hoses might be deployed, at which selected levels, at which times, and with what objective. In 20 questions on RICE, it is estimated that it would take 20 to 40 minutes to evacuate 350 people from a 20-storey building in tenable conditions and average age and fitness with evacuees in single file on the stairway. Thus, whilst it may have been theoretically possible, and therefore it can be said that attempts should have been made to carry out an evacuation, the rice evacuation model would be compromised due to a the absence of any effective means of communicating to residents any evacuation plan b fire comp 
fire compartmentation had been subject to multiple failures. C, condition throughout sections of the stairway were not tenable. The integrity of the stairway had not and could not be maintained. And fourthly, while some occupants were of average age and fitness, there was no available information with regard to numbers who were not fit and whose disabilities might impact on an orderly evacuation in single file. So that's all we propose to say by way of our opening statement. Well, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Brown. Brown. Uh, at that point, we uh, shall take the afternoon break, and we well, we might resume. Well, I say we'll resume at half past three when we shall hear uh, a closing statement from Mr. Stephen Walsh, Queen's Council, on behalf of the London Fire Brigade. So, half past three, then, please. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. We're now going to hear an opening statement uh, by Mr. Stephen Walsh, Greens Council, on behalf of the London Fire Brigade. Yes, Mr. Walsh, when you're ready. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon to you and Ms. Estefan and Mr. Ackball. Um, I, I, just so you know, for timing purposes, I won't be longer than 45 minutes. Well, you've, we've allowed you an hour, so don't feel under any pressure. No, I, well, I don't, but I'm very grateful, sir. So, by far, the most uh, important assertion I can make in these submissions as we move into Module 5 of the inquiry, if I make no other submissions today, although I will, but the most important and the most meaningful is that the primary focus of the London Fire Commissioner is concentrated on learning meaningful lessons from the Grenfell Tower fire. Indeed, the Commissioner's energy and that of the LFB as an organisation has been and remains fully committed to that process. The, the tragic loss of 72 lives and the consequent impact which the events of the 14th of June 2017 have had on the bereaved, the survivors and the residents of Grenfell Tower together with a wider public interest, remains daily, and I mean daily, the driving force behind the London Fire Commissioner's efforts. There is no doubt that the Brigade must and is doing everything in its power to learn the hard lessons from that terrible night. And that is not a platitude. It, it is not a hollow statement as the evidence which the London Fire Commissioner, Commissioner Rowe, will demonstrate in Module 6, if he is given the opportunity to explain in much more detail what has been done, although I will summarise certain matters later on. So it, it, you won't be surprised to hear that in common with uh, many other core participants, I have no intention of repeating all of the facts and matters addressed in our written opening submissions. Uh, which are now in any event public, publicly available. Instead, I would seek only to highlight certain key aspects which we believe will inform the understanding of the evidence which is to be heard now during Module 5. From the very start of the inquiry in early 2018, the LFB, the London Fire Brigade, and to an extent fire and rescue services generally, have rightly come under the microscope. Indeed, it has been subjected to minute scrutiny by a large body of experts commissioned by the inquiry in multiple disciplines. The intense questioning of more than 80 brigade staff in phase one of the inquiry, which I, I think is accepted the LFB not only cooperated in, but largely assisted in facilitating, combined with the scrutiny that the experts have undertaken since the inquiry began its complex task, has revealed areas in which the brigade has been the subject of criticism. And the London Fire Commissioner has made it clear that the London Fire Brigade must and does take full responsibility for its operational response to the fire and for ensuring that the knowledge gained from it is used to maximum effect for the future, while enhancing both public and firefighter safety. Of course it is true that the LFB was not responsible for the causes of the fire or the manner in which it developed or the failings which were exposed in modules one to three of phase two on the part of some who were connected with the refurbishment of the building, which resulted in the eradication of essential fire safety measures, which in turn caused the devastating fire. That is the last and only time in these submissions I will make that point. Because among the vital lessons which must be learned from the tragedy is that the LFB and fire and rescue services around the country 
must plan and develop operational tactics and procedures insofar as they possibly can, which is the key issue which I will come to in a moment, to meet the consequences, should they occur again, of the chain of events which led to the Grenfell Tower fire. And, of course, much of the evidence to be considered in Modules 5 and 6, in, including the expert reports, concern matters and events up to the date of the fire in 2017. But one of the key factors to address, as your phase one report makes clear, sir, is the question whether the LFB could be said to be a learning organization, both before and following the fire. Those are matters, no doubt, which will be addressed through Commissioner Rowe and others in module six. For the purposes of these module five submissions, it is right that the LFC provides an account of what it has been doing and the challenges involved in it, because it has some bearing on the consideration of the challenges faced by fire and rescue services before 2017, which is relevant, of course, to the evidence to be given in Module 5. And I will come to that shortly. Understandably, certain core participants in their Module 5 opening submissions have relied upon a number of the opinions of the experts that is to say, the experts which have been instructed as experts by the inquiry, and extrapolate from them what are said to be hard facts about the manner in which the LFB has gone about its business. But with the exception of Mr McGurk, none of the expert witnesses who have been instructed as experts, who are undoubtedly expert and knowledgeable in their own fields, claim to have expertise in firefighting or managing and operating uh, fire and rescue services. Indeed, many expressly say so, in fairness to them. Obviously, there is no criticism against them, uh, 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 either implied or, or overtly, because their reports actually have provided valuable information to the LFB, and I would think fire and rescue services nationally in the furtherance of, its lesson, of their lesson learning processes. But insofar as those reports impact upon the operation of the LFB and fire and rescue services generally, it's obviously necessary to hear from the present and former LFB senior staff who are to give evidence in modules five and six. Indeed, the submissions of certain of the core participants in their module five openings concern matters which are of particular significance to the issues to be addressed in Module 6 because there is an unavoidable overlap between those two modules. So far, in Phase 2 of this inquiry, there has been no opportunity until now for those who are experienced in firefighting, the people who were and are responsible for key areas of fire and rescue uh, operations, training, resourcing, managing budgets according to government expectations and so on, to address the issues which the inquiry needs to explore and for the experts to hear actually as well um, in relation to the key issues for this inquiry from the perspective of operational firefighting and rescue in the field. Those are that's valuable evidence, which will not, I hope, only inform the inquiry, but also the experts' views. And in order to take any informed view, and in the interest of fairness, those witnesses must be allowed to have their say. They need to be given a fair opportunity to address issues which have arisen during the course of the, this inquiry, and, sir, I know that you and your council team will provide ample opportunity for them to do that. So, with those factors in mind, we resist in these submissions the temptation to engage in counter-argument on uh, numerous matters which are raised in certain of the core participants' opening statements until the evidence has been heard in both modules five and six which we will address in closing submissions at the appropriate time, given that this is an opening submission and not a, not a closing one. 
Um, uh, just briefly, in relation to the extensive report of Dr. Steinov uh, on water augmentation issues, uh, which was disclosed at the, at the beginning of last month or the very end of the, of the month before, the LFP uh, has looked at that. Uh, without a doubt, requires further time to consider a range of matters before a fully informed view can be taken. And I know that Thames Water Utilities is continuing to review that report and take the view quite properly, as, as, as does the LFB, that Dr. Stoyanov will require time to consider what they say about it, indeed what we say about it. And because he's now giving evidence, I think, in Module 7, we will say no more about it now. But there are one or two assertions which have been made by some core participants in their opening statements, which I should briefly address now, some of it was addressed, I think, orally this morning. First of all, the question of trust. Can the witnesses for the London Fire Brigade to be trusted to provide candid and transparent evidence to this inquiry? We say that the answer to that question was provided, in large part, in phase one of the inquiry, when so many brigade witnesses at all levels of command attended to give open and clear evidence about the night of the fire without hidden or overt agendas and in the spirit of providing the bereaved survivors and residents the truth of that tragic night as they saw it. That evidence was, of course, backed up by multiple volumes of material, uh, which was the, LF, which was, uh, the LFB's GTERT team compiled, which provided minute-by-minute minute accounts of what occurred throughout the night of the fire, and which I think it's fair to say informed so much of your Phase 1 report, followed up with the London Fire Brigade's vast and transparent documentary disclosure exercise to the inquiry. And, of course, no London Fire Brigade witnesses sought and have not done so for Modules 5 or 6 the protection of an undertaking from the Attorney General not to use what they tell this inquiry in any subsequent proceedings. All that demonstrates, we say, that the evidence of London Fire Brigade witnesses has and will continue to be open and candid in the full spirit of the duty which public authorities such as the London Fire Brigade owe. And secondly, just very briefly, the issue of foreseeability. I think it's fair to say that certain of the submissions of CPs are predicated on the assumption that the Grenfell Tower fire was an entirely foreseeable event. The experts differ on their views, in their views as we know. So it would be crass to, for me or for anyone else to argue against the proposition that certain factors in this uh, chain of events uh, were foreseeable and within the knowledge of the LFB, for which in some cases the brigade had policies and procedures in place. I'm going to make that clearer because I paused halfway through that sentence. It would be crass to argue against that proposition. There were elements which were foreseeable. But for the purposes of these opening submissions, we simply make the point that the question of foreseeability of the whole incident cannot be answered in simple binary terms, yes or no. It is a complex issue uh, with multiple strands, which include the very significant issue of the sheer scale of the disaster at Granville Tower and the impact which the matters re re revealed in modules one to three had upon it. Those shocking re revelations, by definition, uh, raise serious questions about their foreseeability. So coming back then to the main thrust of, of these oral submissions, fire and rescue services are in a position where they have to consider the, ex the, the extent to which they can plan their operation, operational response to procedures uh, to fires in residential high-rise buildings by anticipating similar widespread failures to those which so this inquiry has found. Planning for such eventualities 
through operational procedures and training is, of course, highly challenging. Not least because buildings such as Grenfell Tower, as we know, were never intended to allow firefighting and rescue on multiple floors, nor were they designed to facilitate a simultaneous evacuation of the full complement of residents. And as I've said, the progress which has been made by the London Fire Commissioner in addressing the phase, phase one report recommendations, including new and revised policies, training and equipment, is summarised in the LFC's written statement, uh, which, and I won't read all of that out again, but I will touch upon it. I will summarise the summary uh, a little later on orally. But to make sense of that work, the work that has been ongoing since the fire, and to better understand the LFC's approach to residential high-rise firefighting before the Grenfell Tower fire, as well as to provide essential context for the issues which will be examined in Module 5, the LFC's written statement revisits the key factors which impact on the ability of fire and rescue services to conduct operations in dangerously unsafe high-rise buildings and the hard challenges which they face in doing so. We have also set out again in, the, in that statement the basic key principles of building design for buildings such as Grenfell Tower in, in those written submissions. They are, all of them in any event by now, well known uh, and I have no intention of repeating them here. Perhaps it is sufficient then to summarise the position as follows. Grenfell Tower was designed, constructed and should have been maintained to support a well-established fire strategy from a safety perspective, which is provided by law and supported by a range of regulatory requirements. That's what should have been the case. As Dr. Lane put it, the strategy, she's talking about the stay put strategy, which, which I think everyone knows is not a fire and rescue service strategy, it's a, it's a design principle. The stay put strategy is provided through design, construction and ongoing maintenance, says Dr. Lane. All building occupants, including the fire brigade, rely on it in the event of a fire. It is the single safety condition provided for in the design of high-rise residential buildings in England. The statutory guidance makes no provision within the building for anything other than the stay-put strategy. There is no means of warning nor a means to communicate the need to increase the areas to be evacuated as is currently regulated for in other building uses, which have complex fire suppression systems which have evacuation drills, strategies, alarm systems and so on. And so it follows that in developing, it, it's no good fire, uh, fire and rescue services saying well look it's not designed so there's nothing we can do. That, that, that is not what the London Fire Brigade says. But what it, what it means is that in developing operational procedures which must be done to address fires in certain high-rise residential buildings. Fire and rescue services must do so on the basis that the single safety condition may have been entirely compromised. And the provisions for fire and rescue operations which the building was designed to facilitate con consequently rendered inoperable. And, and to put it in stark terms, in short, fire brigades must now, and they must, plan for operations in residential high-rise buildings, which by reason of their design actively thwart attempts to fight fire and to rescue and evacuate residents. Some of the consequent obstacles which must be overcome have been addressed in previous submissions which we have made to you, sir, and they shed light on the approach of fire and rescue services. They are also set out in the LFC's written submissions, which I don't intend to repeat now, though I will, if I may, but just by example, touch upon the problems surrounding firefighter safety uh, and the challenges of internal firefighting and rescue. And can I make this clear? Uh, that the identification in these submissions of challenges which fire brigades face in developing policy and procedure 
to address fundamentally failing buildings cannot be taken as a reluctance to meet those challenges. They are being met as far as possible, but it is vital that the challenges and therefore the potential limitations on fire and rescue services are understood both before the fire on the 14th of June 2017 and afterwards. So briefly, what are the examples of challenges to fire and rescue services that I just want to touch upon? First, the, the very basic point, uh, as far as can be discerned, all of the inquiry's experts agree that for the purpose of developing fire safety measures for residential high-rise buildings of the kind this inquiry is considering, the following assumptions are made by the building regulations and the broader regulatory system which determines how these buildings are designed and built. Only single unit fires are anticipated or allowed for. Multiple fires on multiple levels are not anticipated or allowed for. Vertical or lateral fires on the exterior are not anticipated or allowed for. And simultaneous evacuation on a large scale is not anticipated or allowed for. And clearly, the viability of those assumptions and the integrity of the building's fire safety strategy are dependent upon adherence to the principles of fire safety contained in the building regulations and elsewhere when constructing, maintaining, and refurbishing the building. If they are not, if they're not, the challenges to fire and rescue services in case of fire become extremely onerous. In his phase one report, Professor Torero made the point that the means by which a the fire service can alter the strategy, that is to say the say put strategy, are very basic. By knocking on flat entrance doors, by operating sounders in residence flats in the unusual circumstances in which they're available. And importantly, all of these approaches, says Professor Torero in his first report, are inconsistent with a fire that has spread vertically or horizontally, as it did at, at, Grenfell, at Grenfell Tower. And so that leads me to the question of firefighters' safety, uh, which is inextricably linked to the safety of residents uh, and the people they strive to protect. One of the primary challenges in planning and executing firefighting and evacuation in buildings uh, in, in, like this, those which are failing, uh, was identified, sir, by you, if I may say so, in your phase one report. And I hope you, uh, you wouldn't mind if I just repeat one or two examples. At paragraph 2863, you, and I'm quoting, recognize that the mechanics of carrying out an evacuation of any sort in rapidly deteriorating conditions would have presented its own risks to the lives of residents and firefighters. And that's a fact. We entirely agree with that, we, if I may say so. And then at paragraph 28.80, sir, you characterize um, Assistant Commissioner Rose, as he then was, strategy on the night of the fire as an intention Quote, to flood the building with as many EDBA wearers, that is extended duration breathing apparatus wearers, as were available, and to provide as much assistance as possible to the remaining occupants. The strategy was both bold and necessary. However, it meant that firefighters would be deployed into the tower without any firefighting equipment, which was both contrary to policy and created a very significant risk to their safety, uh, and, and one might add, and, and consequently to the residents, they're there to try and protect and, and assist. The London Fire Commissioner has previously expressed his appreciation to you, Mr Chairman, for your acknowledgement of the bravery and selflessness of firefighters who were deployed into Grenfell Tower, and your broad approval of the sentiments he uh, expressed in his evidence to you when he acknowledged the fact 
that big organizations must always improve systems and training through learning, but at the same time paid tribute to the bravery of firefighters on the night, who, and these are his words, which you met with your broad approval, who put themselves at enormous risk for hour after hour after hour, and were battling against what was frankly an absolute failure of the building system, and they had done their absolute best in intolerable circumstances. My junior officers performed well beyond what was acceptable in terms of their physical and mental capacity, and actually, in some numbers, have paid the price consequently. Well, of course, firefighting and affecting rescue uh, of necessity is a dangerous occupation even where the built environment broadly adheres to established fire safety measures. And that's what firefighters take on when they take the job. But the potential obligation on fire brigades to assume when planning fire and rescue operations that such measures will be ignored or flouted to a substantial degree by building owners and others places substantially higher risks on firefighters and residents alike. And the perennial question for fire and rescue services is where the line should be drawn. At what point, notwithstanding the overarching desire and will to save savable life, does the risk to firefighters become too great to justify under health and safety legislation, given that serious injury or worse to firefighters has a direct impact on the safety of residents? How far can fire and rescue services push the risk envelope while maintaining its duty to protect the safety of its employees. Now, that, that preparedness to push the risk envelope um, is one which, well, there was an example of it, I suppose, during the course of the redevelopment of the high-rise firefighting and evacuation policy, which the LFC uh, was involved in very recently, and which um, Ms. Studd, Queen's Counsel, on behalf of the Mayor, mentioned earlier on. That dilemma had been highlighted in the recent consultation in respect of the Brigade's uh, new policy, where the appropriate safe use of breathing apparition by firefighters above the bridgehead was the subject of considerable debate and, frankly, disagreement between the London Fire Commissioner and the Fire Brigade's union. It is just one example of the ongoing consultation, which, by the way, is required by law. The, uh, all fire and rescue services are required by law to consult with the unions. Um, and that was an example of, of just such a thing. There's no criticism, by the way, of the FBU there, because it is part of their function to, to consider matters of that, and it's part of the LFC's function to look to saving <clears throat> savable life and to push that envelope as far as possible. But they are very difficult, very difficult issues to resolve. In the years following the Grenfell Tower fire, the, uh, the Commissioner has made strenuous efforts to address this challenging issue in liaison with many stakeholders, including the National Fire Chiefs Council and, of course, the Fire Brigade's Union, among others. Um, and very importantly, I, I mentioned this in our Module 3 opening, but, but it is actually quite significant. The LFC has commissioned and led groundbreaking research in, in association with the University of Bath into the physiological effects on firefighters who are deployed into high-rise buildings, uh, which has revealed significant results uh, which have a direct impact on the capabilities of fire and rescue services in this country and, in fact, worldwide, what we're discovering. And that actually brings me to the relevant issue of internal firefighting in buildings of the kind that we are here considering. As the evidence in phase one made clear, the statutory requirement for the design of residential high-rise buildings are predicated on the basis that fires in compartments must be fought internally. There's no provision, at least in the regulations, for external firefighting. They just don't provide for it, don't the building regulations. Although, of course, at Grenfell Tower, strenuous efforts were made to attack the fire externally 
in extremely dangerous conditions on the night, and we'll be revisiting that, I think, again in, in Module 7. However, during the Renfell Tower fire, <coughs> assuming uh, that it would have been reasonable at the early stages to anticipate that a fire in the external cladding would spread as far and as rapidly as it did, it would have been a fundamental departure from high-rise firefighting procedure to abandon internal firefighting, as some have suggested perhaps should have been done. Uh, and that would have been a departure from uh, procedure for a number of reasons, chief among which, in a fire of that kind, is the absolute need to continue protecting internal escape routes for, for residents. And while the statutory requirements for the design of high-rise residential buildings provide for only internal firefighting, as I've said, what they don't do, they do not contemplate that fire services may be required to fight fires on multiple floors at the same time. And of course, at Grenfell Tower, there were simultaneous serious fires on multiple floors. And importantly, whether a building is fitted with a dry or a wet riser, because that's how internal firefighting, that's how the water is provided to the internal part of the tower, the provision is for only two firefighting jets to be connected to the main, the dry or wet rising main, which is sufficient to deal with a single compartment fire envisaged by the building regulations. And this, the important thing is that the system of, of the main, the rising main, and the mechanisms do not allow for their use on more than one or perhaps two floors at one time. Whatever the available flow rates of water from the external hydrants, with the consequence that fires cannot be fought on multiple floors. The regulatory regime simply doesn't contemplate the need for it. And the challenge it presents to fire brigades is the major problem of how do you go about deploying firefighters into areas of a building without the means to protect themselves and residents from fire. Um, turning to, uh, th th these are challenges that I'm pointing out. I, I, I say again, we're pointing out the challenges, we're not saying they, that they can't be done, but they are difficult. On the question of evacuation generally, more generally, so we have set out in our uh, written submissions the challenges which fire and rescue services face um, in planning evacuation in uh, high-rise residential buildings which uh, are significantly failing and which don't allow for simultaneous evacuation. Those challenges have been well documented in our previous submissions and in that document and indeed by the experts to the inquiry, uh, they are very well understood, and I don't propose to repeat them all for you now, but they're there in the document for anyone to see. But the point is that those challenges, all of those challenges, one of the, I've just given a couple of examples of them, existed before the fire, before 14th of June 2017, and still exist. Um, so that the LFB's new policies and procedures are the product of very careful thought uh, in consultation with stakeholders on a national basis. They go as far as possible to addressing this extremely difficult issue and to a significant extent, I use that phrase again, again pushing the envelope as far as is reasonably possible to meet the real challenges. And while I'm on the subject of evacuation, I just want to m m mention something which um, Professor Thomas uh, discussed this morning in, of Queen's Council in his oral opening submissions and I just want to resolve what might be a misunderstanding concerning what can be learned from other fires around the world. The, let me just make it very clear. The London Fire Commission acknowledges absolutely that there is much to learn about fire behaviour in modern high-rise buildings from examples of other fires around the world, which can inform the development of policy and procedures to address similar, similar fires in London and, and around this country. Recognising the importance of this since the Grenfell Tower fire, the Brigade has reviewed the process 
by which information, which is, which is fixed in the brigade's uh, engineering and fire safety department, is channeled to operational staff so as to improve the mass of information available to incident commanders about fire behavior in high-rise buildings in the context of the increasing complexity of construction design and materials used in new builds and refurbishments. However, the extent to which examples of other fires around the world can inform the development of evacuation procedures in the UK, particularly for state-put buildings, is much more restricted. And that is because many of the fires were in differently designed buildings with different regulatory re regimes. And many of those other fires were in buildings which were either designed or built to support simultaneous evacuation or, or which had other aspects of it. So an example was given this morning of, of the La Crosse fire in Melbourne. Now, much learning can be had from the way in which that fire developed externally. But there's not a great deal of learning, it might be said, that, that could be derived in relation to how you evacuate a state-put building because the La Crosse building had very sophisticated fire suppression systems which were phased all the way down the building, alarm systems, and so on and so forth, whereas state-put buildings, as we know, have none of that at all. So that, I hope, was just... Um, I, I just wanted to resolve what might have been a misunderstanding about our point on that. Uh, of course, there are examples in this country, and the Lackanal House fire might be a near example of, of, of that. Uh, but but uh, just slight warning to guard against equating that fire, the Lackanal House fire, too closely with the fire at Grenfell Tower, because the Lackanal House fire did not involve rain screen cladding, and the primary issues were associated with internal breaches of compartmentation and fire loading in concealed spaces. But that said, there is no doubt that the Lackanal House fire, in terms of lesson learning, had a significant bearing on the operation of brigade control rooms. And we accept that. And we understand that the issues concerning the operation of the LFB control room on the night of the Grenfell Tower fire, in light of the learning from the Lackanal House fire, and the provision of fire survival guidance to biocontrol staff to residents is to be addressed in Module 6. Um, and in the circumstances, we'll re reserve more detailed submissions about that until the appropriate time. For the present, we remind you that in Phase 1, the London Fire Commissioner uh, expressly accepted in closing submissions that there are undoubtedly lessons which must be learned from the night of the Grenville Tower fire in respect of control room policy and training. Uh, on a different topic now, that of risk information gathering, we need to touch briefly upon the most recent report but one of Professor Torreira. When I say that, there was a very recent report. I'm talking about one just before that. We, we had addressed, in fact, one aspect of that report in our written Module 5 submissions, but then we understood he was going to give evidence Module 6, so we took them out. So I'm putting them back in now orally, only in summary form. The LFC accepts that the gathering of information concerning risks to fire safety in the built environment is a vital factor in the planning of operational procedures to address them. Indeed, significant steps have been taken to improve the process of risk information gathering at the LFB since the Grenfell Tower fire. One of the mechanisms for achieving this involves the effective use of the expertise which exists in the LFB's engineering and fire safety department, which among other things, uh, monitors develops, developments in modern construction and design techniques for the purpose of providing advice and guidance to building owners and to the brigade itself. As the letters, as you may recall, from Assistant Commissioners Turek and Daly to local authorities uh, did. That was the purpose of them. And they were considered in Module 2, I think, 
Dr. Lane described them as sensible approaches. Professor Torero, in his uh, recent report, uh, considers the matter again. But if one goes back to his earlier reports and his, his published approach much more widely, he strongly advocates the need for much greater expertise and competence across all stakeholders, particularly designers, architects, engineers, and so on, to keep pace with the exponential increase in recent years of the complexity of modern construction methods and materials. That's his basic position, and it's, it's, it's a compelling one. On that theme, it is Professor Torero's uh, view that fire and rescue services throughout the country should dramatically increase the number of its staff who are trained to a suitable level of expertise, competence, in the technical principles of modern construction and materials so as to be able to engage from an early stage in the design and construction phase of significant refurbishments and new builds. The purpose, he says is to enable fire and rescue services to identify failures which can affect the performance of a particular building prior to a fire event and to eliminate previously unforeseeable events through inspection and understanding of building behavior in the modern and more complex context. Now, compelling though such an approach might be for the future, and it is compelling, in order for fire and rescue services to engage in the design and build process, to that extent, there would not only need to be a change in culture involving industry, central and local government and the fire sector generally, but a significant change in the legislative structure with considerably increased support and funding to give effect to such changes. And I come finally, uh, sir, now as a topic to a, a very brief explanation of the products of the London Fire Commissioner's intense learning program over the last four years, which in many ways is a continuation of the process of learning which the LFC would maintain has always been a characteristic priority of the London Fire Brigade. Further detail can be found in the written submissions, which themselves amount to a summary, but we re-emphasize that uh, a much fuller account, which I know many have expressed the desire for, will be provided by the Commission himself in Module 6, if he's permitted to do so, for the purpose of answering the question posed in the Phase 1 report, whether the LFB has learned lessons, and if so, to what extent, since the Grenfell Tower fire. It is fair to say that it has been the LFC's Commissioner Rowe's priority since his appointment to drive forward progress in relation to your recommendation, sir following phase one, recognizing the need to demonstrate that the LFB is a learning organization committed to continuous involvement and improvement. Some of the new measures which have been introduced address the recommendations in your phase one report, while others represent the brigade's own ongoing process of learning and development, which is central to its ethos and is a key feature of its operational planning. Um, in, in very short summary form, a suite uh, of new and revised measures has been adopted following wide consultation and careful consideration of the multiple challenges which fire and rescue services face when planning uh, and executing fire and rescue operations in dangerously failing buildings. Among the changes are a range of new and revised policies which address high-rise firefighting, evacuation as a separate topic, fire survival guidance as a separate topic. And each of these policies, which are in many respects pretty closely interlinked, provide guidance and procedures for incident commanders and control staff to follow, including communication strategies in extreme circumstances of the kind experienced at Grenville Tower. In relation to high-rise evacuation and evacuation issues, a I've called it here on my document voluminous, I, think, I hope you know what I mean by that, a voluminous face-to-face -face theory training program uh, was delivered to approximately 4,500 staff over the course of and within a year during, in fact, the lockdown and the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> Further policies address risk information gathering and incident command, while extensive work has been carried out to improve information sharing between the Brigade Specialist Fire Safety Department and operational staff. And in the field of incident command uh, training, the, the Commission has established a dedicated incident command training team to ensure that a golden thread uh, of training is implemented from the control room officers through to command unit crews, facilitating more effective lines of communication between brigade control and the incident ground. And then finally, from a summary perspective, in addition to the suite of new policies on high-rise firefighting, uh, evacuation of fire survival guidance, and operation risk gathering, the LFC has overseen real changes in a range of other areas, including control communications, fire ground and general communications, including equipment, and the acquisition of new and additional equipment, including a fleet of new aerial appliances, groundbreaking remote drain cap drone capability, and of course the use of smoke hoods across the brigade. In conclusion, the question whether the London Fire Brigade is a learning organization <clears throat> will be informed by the evidence of those past and present officers who are to give evidence in modules five and six when they are given an opportunity to explain the challenges and the realities of providing firefighting and rescue services in one of the most populous, complex and den densely built cities in the world. For the present, the LFC reminds the Sir you and, and your colleagues on the panel of the assertion he made in his evidence towards the end of phase one. He has always been clear that large organizations must always develop policy and procedure through learning from experience. And that culture must be embedded and it must be never ending. He is clear that the London Fire Brigade must be proactive in its approach, particularly with regard to the increasing complexity of modern construction and design methods and materials insofar as the impact on fire safety. That is the, 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 the fact that, for, that all fire and rescue services are, well, they certainly are now, alerted to the dangers which can exist in buildings of this kind where a refurbishment or maintenance of previously safe buildings has been conducted in a way to fundamentally undermine that, that safety is a challenge. That, those are the challenges which are facing <clears throat> the London Fire Brigade, but all other fire and rescue services in the UK. And, and those challenges are being met head on. The commissioner, the London Fire Commission, has paramount consideration is and always has been to protect the safety of Londoners in case of fire and other emergencies. The same consideration was the imperative behind the determined efforts of firefighters on the night to do their best in the most dangerous of conditions. And this is always so in the mind of the Commissioner. It is always so in the mind of the women and men who make up the London Fire Brigade. The interests of the bereaved survivors and residents of Grenfell Tower remain at the very heart of the LFB's continuing commitment to learn from the tragic events of the 14th of June 2017 and to effect meaningful change wherever possible. Well, so I, did, I don't have any, anything further at the moment. Well, Mr. Walsh, thank you very much indeed. That's been a very helpful statement. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, that's all, all the opening statements we're expecting to receive. Uh, tomorrow we shall embark on the first of the witnesses in Module 5, and that will be at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. But at this point, we shall close for the day. Thank you very much. 10 o'clock tomorrow morning.